Hello, everyone, and welcome to Coffee with Cannon on this Saturday early afternoon. Beautiful Saturday here in uh, Westchester County, New York. Uh, where's all my uh, Where's all my folks from across the pond? You guys are taking your time to get here. It's not like you're taking a boat or flying a plane. You should be immediately into the comments. <laughs> well, I'll wait for you guys. I know everyone's going to be showing up any minute now. And uh, this is, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more today about the whole Julia for Justice, Alec and Hilaria feed off drama. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the uh, the Alec Baldwin case. Snoozy girl, hello from Great Britain, Britain the UK. Great to see you. Uh, it seems like, you know, they're still doing like a public relations uh, thing on this case. And uh, Bernie Manley here from the Maine, formerly Northern Ireland. Great to see you, Bernie Manley. I like that name, Bernie Manley. <laughs> Great name. Mustang, hi, y'all. Good to see you guys. Coffee with Cannon. Yes, we are. Coffee. I, I forgot to pull my coffee cup up here. I might have to get it later on. Um, so, yeah, yesterday there was a, a letter came out, or actually on the 10th of uh, December, from purportedly from um, the crew of rust and it was about two dozen people signed it that's not a lot out of a, a crew that uh, may have been up to a hundred people but it just sounds it sounds very self-serving and I, I I mean these cases are never tried in the media they're never tried on television they're never tried in the press so I'm just wondering like what is this what's the whole point of this the whole point uh Morgan Ashley Roll, good to see you. Sorry you're late. Well, you're here. I'm glad to see you. Liam, hello. How are you? Staying classy? This should be good, though. Yeah, I mean, it's never tried um, in the press. So why is all of this behind-the-scenes public relations stuff? I'm going to play a little bit of uh, a video that came out on the 10th of, um, of December in regards to this letter that was um, sent out by the crew um, in support of Alec Baldwin and basically in support of the production. Making a return to the stage overnight and also hosting virtually. Welcome to the Robert F. Kennedy. Alec Baldwin did not address the tragedy on the set of Rust just days after his interview with ABC News. The trigger wasn't pulled. I didn't pull the trigger. But the sheriff's office says whatever Baldwin's recollection is, the firearm was somehow manipulated in a manner that caused it to fire the bullet that struck Miss Hutchins, resulting in her death. The investigation moving forward as the veteran actor posted this letter, Baldwin says, is from some of the film's crew. The description of Rust as a chaotic, dangerous, and exploitative workplace are false, it reads. It's common to work on unprofessional or hectic productions. Rust was not one of them. One of the crew members tells NBC News the note was signed by over two dozen members of the production. A rebuttal to allegations, the Western was riddled with unsafe working conditions, which some suggest may have led to the death of cinematographer Helena Hutchins. Concerns Baldwin says he was never made aware of. I did not observe any safety or security issues at all in the time I was there. Before the fatal shooting, crew members say several people walked off the set citing multiple grievances, including worries about safety. The letter's author writing, those disgruntled few do not represent the views of all of us. Lane Looper was one of those who resigned and retained an attorney. Yes, he spoke to us last month. Look, I, I went to work every day unwittingly playing a game of, of Russian roulette. I can't say that I regret leaving. This morning, as more questions swarm over the deadly shooting and a growing number of crew members speak out, conditions behind the scenes are once again taking center stage. So, Miguel, Alec Baldwin's wife also apparently opening up a bit about his mental health, about his state of mind right now as all of this plays out. What, what does she say? Well, that's right, Craig. Hilaria Baldwin took to social media saying her husband has been suffering from PTSD for, quote, a long time, but it's now worse than ever. Baldwin, of course, was holding the gun and pointing it at Helena Hutchins when the firearm went off, and authorities are still working to determine whether to issue criminal charges to those involved handling the firearm. Mm -hmm. Craig. All right, Miguel Amalgar Force there in Los Angeles. Miguel, thank you. 
So, folks, there you have it. I mean, you know, Shakespeare said, uh, you doth protesteth too much. And when you protest too much, it more or less puts more guilt on you than if you just keep your mouth shut. Because as I said, this case is not going to be tried in the media. And there is a, an investigation going on by the only people that count in this investigation, and that's the Santa Fe Police Department and the District Attorney's Office. And they're going to come to a conclusion in, in, in a couple of months, and they're going to come to a conclusion over whether this incident was in fact criminal or should it be just uh, treated as an accident and be treated as a civil matter. You know there's going to be millions and millions of dollars of lawsuits in this case. So in that way, uh, no matter how much they protest about, oh, this was, I didn't, I didn't pull the trigger. And, you know, I, I, we've many, many um, uh, ballistics experts have been on TV. They've been online. And they have a commonality in their finding. And their commonality is that for that gun to go off, you have to pull the trigger. All right. You, he had to pull the trigger minus some uh, operability problems with the gun, ma minus some malfunction. And the first thing that police departments do in their ballistics examination of a firearm is to do what's called an operability test. So they'll test that gun for operability. And once they determine, yes, it's operable, there goes his whole or his attorney's argument that the gun malfunctioned. No, I think what it's going to determine is that Alec, in fact, pulled the trigger of that firearm. And it is, in fact, operable. And he pulled the trigger. And that's why it went off. Uh, there, was the, there was one disgruntled employee that we saw. Uh, and I'm going to play a little bit of what he said. And there were multiple reports that the set was unsafe, that there was uh, people shooting uh, firearms, shooting loaded uh, guns on the set on their off, their off time. And that might explain why there was a live round. And a live round was, in fact, put into that 45 caliber real revolver. People use the term prop gun. No, that was a real 45 pound, 45 caliber firearm that was capable of firing a projectile. And in fact, that's what it did. It filed a projectile, which resulted in the death of Helena, Helena uh, Hutchins. So I'm going to share the screen again uh, with this gentleman who worked on the uh, crew. Or unsafe on set or offset, you know, I have never been, I've never felt I was more in danger of dying on the set or on the drive home. So I was exhausted. Rust camera operator Lane Looper speaking to Sky News' Martha Kalenner, doubling down on his earlier statements to NBC about unsafe working conditions on the set of Rust, conditions he believed led to the death of Helena Hutchins. This set was unsafe simply because they didn't have the wherewithal to, you know, follow you know, safety rules that we have in this industry that we've been following for decades. Do you believe that Helena's death was preventable? Absolutely. Absolutely. This week, Russ producers denied Looper's earlier allegations, saying Mr. Looper's allegations around budget and safety are patently false. Safety is always the number one priority in our films. Tonight, we're also learning new details about the film's finances. The Hollywood Reporter revealing a draft of the $7.3 million budget, with $650,000 earmarked to pay producers and almost $8,000 to pay armorer Hannah Gutierrez-Reed. NBC News has not independently verified that budget, but a source close to production tells NBC News producers had not yet been paid at the time production shut down. Meanwhile, the investigation continues, with authorities working to determine how a live round got on set and whether recent allegations of intentional sabotage are accurate. Fair to say from what you've seen so far that corners were cut on this set in some regards. I think corners were definitely cut on this set. The fallout from the shooting leading to change in Hollywood. The cast and crew of The Rookies seen this week in Los Angeles filming with airsoft guns. Movie star Dwayne The Rock Johnson also says his films will no longer include real firearms. Will not use 
real guns uh, ever again. We are going to be using rubber guns, and we'll take care of it in post. And we won't worry about the dollars. We won't worry about math or what the cost is. I think we're going to do it the right way. Aaron McLaughlin joins us now from Los Angeles. So, Aaron, what else did that budget draft obtained by The Holly Reporter show us? Hey, Allison, what well, we're learning new details about Alec Baldwin's compensation. According to that report, he signed for $150,000, his production company for $100,000, which industry insiders say is really not that much money, that this would have been a passion project for a household name like Alec Baldwin's. Allison? Aaron, thank you. So as you can see, they spoke about the budget of the movie. That, that woman you saw that was interviewed was the district attorney from Santa Fe. And she said that there definitely was corners cut on this budget. So that letter that uh, was issued by the staff that I previously played, that seems just like a, a PR thing. Like, you know, as I said, you doth protesteth too much. And, you know, who are they protesting to? Ultimately, the district attorney and the police, the investigators, are going to determine, and the district attorney, in fact, is going to determine whether or not there's, in fact, going to be charges in this incident. And no matter how many um, letters they put out, uh, letters of support, letters of protest, saying that the uh, the whole set was uh, was that was dangerous. People that are refuting that and saying no, in fact, it wasn't dangerous. It doesn't matter because the the, uh, the district attorney is going to issue her findings. Once she determines, look, someone died in this. I don't know if you guys know, but the term homicide, you know, many people misuse that term. And homicide simply means death caused by another. A homicide doesn't, in fact, have to be criminal. You could accidentally cause someone's death and it could be ruled not criminal. There's also uh, justifiable homicides are also ruled homicides. But in fact, by law, they can be determined justifiable based upon many, many things. Self-defense is one of them. So because you hear the word homicide, homicide doesn't specifically mean murder with intent. It just means death caused by another. And then it needs uh, investigation. Uh, Morgan Ashley Roll, celebrity is just the luck. Staying classy. They should never in this day and age use real guns. Uh, I think that, you know, this is going to change Hollywood. Uh, with our technology, fake ones made to look and sound like real ones. Bullets should not even be able to fit into them at all. Infuriates me. That's by staying classy. Yes, you know something? I think this is going to change Hollywood uh, in the way that they do business in regards to firearms. And as The Rock said in that little um, film clip you watched, is that they can put the sound effects in post-production. So an actor just has to act as if he's firing a firearm. When it goes off, he has to act as if it has the recoil. You know, that it, it cocks back and makes, you, makes your hand uh, go up in the air. And that's just very simple to do. When you fire a firearm, that's, that's what occurs. There's a recoil and it forces your hand in the air. You know, a lot of the, um, even the the interview, I uh, we've been, this is about my third or fourth um, show that I've uh, recorded in regards to uh, the Rust movie set shooting. Because I, I find it, um, I don't like the way that Hollywood is in cahoots with the news media. And it seemed to me that uh, George Stephanopoulos and ABC News, they just stepped up and they provided a platform for public relations uh, platform for Alec Bolden to just extol his innocence and how he didn't pull the trigger. He didn't do anything. He's not responsible for anything. He knows nothing. He sees nothing. I'm going to just play a little bit of part one of that interview. They've actually broken the interview up now into, um, into four parts, believe it or not. And so I'm going to play a little bit of, uh, of the interview and um, let's get, I'll get it up on the screen and just to see the flavor of it, because I think you need to, to hear his voice and see what he's saying. And you can either determine whether you feel he's telling the truth or he's making this up. Uh, just watch a little bit of this interview right now. You're off. Let me get slight. Marker. Good. 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 Good.
Alec, thank you for doing this. You, you haven't said much in public since that tragic accident. Why, why speak out now? Well, I think that um, there's a criminal investigation that could be a while. Uh, there's all kinds of civil litigation. And I felt there were a number of misconceptions, most of it from sources I really wouldn't concern myself about, but a couple that I did concern myself about, where there were these authoritative statements about this is what happened. The sheriff's department hasn't even released a report to the DA yet. The reason I wanted to sit down with you is because I really feel like I can't wait for that process to fit to end in February, March. I mean, I'm not asking them to speed it up for my benefit. He can't wait for what? This is not his defense. If I was his defense attorney, I would be telling him, Alex, stay the hell off of TV and do not talk about this in public nor in private because you could tell someone something in private and they could become a witness against you. But he, he has that ego where he just needs to keep talking. And I thought that's ridiculous. But I am saying that they're going to do what they need to do. And I wanted to come to talk to you to say that well, I would go to any lengths to undo what happened. I would go to any lengths to undo. And what does that mean? He would go to any lengths. You can't undo the past. So why are you even saying that? It's, it's just the language that he uses. I find it so, so pathetic. Undo what happened. I think the big question, and the one you must have asked yourself a thousand times, how could this have happened? Well, there's two things I want to say about that. One is that when I talk about this, my concern is that I don't sound like I'm the victim. Because there is a victim. There's a woman who died, and my friend got shot. He's my friend, and she was a new friend. I met her, and we worked together on the some of the mapping out of what we we're going to do on the film, which, you know, in the movie terms, if you go make a movie with Scorsese, you and the DP don't sit down, and they solicit your ideas of how to make the film, you know what I mean? In the case of Helena, we sat down collaboratively and talked a lot about what we wanted to do in that uh, a precious amount of time we had. But um, I, I, I want to make sure that I don't come across like I'm the victim because we have two victims here. And the second thing is, is that all on the day leading up to this event was precipitated on one idea, and that is that Helena and I had something profound in common. And that is we both assumed the gun was empty. Other than those, you know, uh, dummy rounds. I want to get into more detail on the day in a minute, but let's take a step back. What was it that drew you to this project in the first place, to Rust? You know, is it, is it a dummy round or is it the dummy who the gun is in a person's hand? That dummy. Because we're taught in the police department that a gun is never empty. You always treat a firearm as if it is loaded. And when I say that the, two, the following two words or the following two sentences, every single cop will know where it comes from. And I'll say, holst your weapon, but first... Do a visual and physical inspection of your firearm. Every single cop on the New York City Police Department will say, that's what we were taught at the range. And it was drilled through your skull from the, your time in the police academy to the time you left the job. Before you holster your firearm, do a visual and physical inspection. Once you are satisfied that the firearm is empty, you may holster your weapon. That was the sentences that Every single range officer said to us, ad nauseum, all the time. So when I hear him, who's Phil, Alec Baldwin, filled with excuses, trying to absolve himself as if he's a priest, no, you pulled that trigger. You're responsible. Do I believe it was an accident? I believe 100%, Alec. I'll give you that. It was an accident. But don't try to step away from responsibility by, we believe that it was a cold gun. Well, maybe you should have checked it before you said it, cold gun, you know? Nikki Bella, how are you? Good to see you. Hal, zigzag ground zero. Why was she murdered? What what did she know? I don't, I don't believe this is a um, conspiracy. I don't believe that at all. I don't believe, I mean, uh, I think Miss um, Gutierrez Reed, the armor attorneys tried to act as if uh, if it was a some kind of sabotage. I don't believe that for a second. Attorneys will say anything to get their client off. Uh, 
Alec is being dishonest. This interview is to prime the jury and falsely setting the facts as he twists them to be knowing the interview is monitored by people wanting to sue them. Um, you know, something I, I also wonder why he is being interviewed all over the place. I mean, what what does he think it's going to do? Is it going to somehow absolve him of something? I don't I don't think so. I think that the more you talk in, in these investigations, and you got to realize there potentially could be a two-part um, liability in this. And two parts, by two parts, I mean there could be a criminal part where he can, in fact, get indicted for criminally negligent harm or manslaughter, and for sure, 1,000%, he's going to be sued civilly. So everything he says right now is being recorded and can be used in both A, the criminal case, and B, the civil case. So any good attorney will tell their client, stop talking, stop going on TV, stop talking about it to people. Uh, You cannot help yourself by talking. People uh, are not priests. They're not going to absolve you of what happened. So you have to make sure that you stop talking about this. I'm going to share a little more of this video and we'll see um, who the armorer was. Um, Put her on the screen for a sec. And she was also the assistant prop master for the film. One of the things her attorney has said is that she was hired for two positions on the film and therefore was stretched in an inappropriate way. Did she raise any of those concerns with you? No, I assume that everyone who's shooting a lower budget film uh, is stretched, myself included. And I, I, I got no complaints from her or the prop department. I'm not sitting there when I'm getting dressed and ready to go to a scene and say, oh my God, the prop woman seemed very harried today. I didn't get a sense of that from, from, from any of the, 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 the people on the film. The first time I heard that there was any problem with anybody uh, in the crew of the film was when Luber said, well, we have some issues here. Lane Luper, the first camera assistant, would email production managers a resignation letter later that night, citing safety concerns. Quote, during the filming of gunfights on this job, things are often played very fast and loose. So far, there have been two accidental weapons discharges. He also wrote about concerns about reasonable rest and housing for local crew with long commutes to the set. When he quit, now, the day before that happened, we wrapped. And he came up to me and he said, thank you for the position you've taken on behalf of IATSE and the union on social media. I said, my pleasure. This photo, posted by Helena, showed the cast and crew in solidarity with IATSE, the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees, which had been on the verge of a strike. And Alec posted this on Instagram. And I want to say to the people in IATSE, do what you need to do. You want to go on strike? Go on strike. Because I'll tell you something about... You know, it just seems to me that uh, George Snuffleupagus there is like uh, providing like cover for Alec Baldwin. Alec put this online in support of Yahtzee. Is that a journalist's um, job? Or is he supposed to be asking difficult questions? Anthony Facer, thank you so much for the $5 super chat. Uh, Coffee on me. We appreciate what you do. Keep it up and always stay safe. You always treat a firearm as it's live, loaded, and then recheck it again. You're 100% correct, Anthony. And I don't think it was treated that way on this set. I think there was, was in fact, a lot of uh, fast and loose stuff going on on this set and, you know, resulting in an accident, you know, in in a horrible accident where someone was killed. And I, I don't think that you can say enough, um, you know, firearm safety just has to be, as I told you, re- repeated. And uh, that's Helena Hutchins. And uh, she was the much loved and much admired videographer on this movie. And, you know, y- you can never take something back. Once something happens, you know, we all know it. that's it. It's You can't go back and say you woulda, shoulda, coulda, if I had to do it over. You don't get to do it over. This, is, this isn't this is playing football in the street when you were a kid where you get a do-over with a car's coming, you know? Uh, it, life is what it is. When things happen in real time, you can't undo the things. But we can recreate what, what occurred through an investigation, you know? And uh, 
to find out, in fact, what the truth is, what actually happened, you know? And I'm sure um, Alec Baldwin uh, regrets the hell out of what happened. And I'm, sh- you know, I'm sure if he could undo it, of course he would. We all would do undo things in our lives if we could. But guess what? We can't, you know? You can't undo the past. You can only try to do it better and learn from your mistakes, you know? Um, but I just, having said that, I, I just, um, Joseph Sillo, the woman was, you know, Joseph Sillo, I don't know if this is true or not. I'll read what you said. The woman was exposing trafficking of children in Hollywood in a documentary. She did such uh, exposés implicating Russians and anti-Russian propaganda. I don't know enough about that to tell you whether that's true or not. Uh, uh, but so, I'll, you know, I don't know what to say about that. I don't want to put any conspiracy theories that I can't verify there. Hello, Marie Green. Uh, you know, another thing that was said, um, the um, the district attorney never, ever said that she would not prosecute this case. She never, ever said that. And I believe that um, Alec Baldwin had implied that he was told that um, there were the chances of this being prosecuted were very, 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 very remote. I don't know if that was ever said. I really don't know. I think that uh, he may have said that, but certainly the district attorney uh, never said that. I'll see if I can find a, uh, a, a little piece of film that, that in fact said that. Uh, let me just play a little bit more of this. We, we've all seen that picture of you off the set in that hour or so after the gun went off. What were you doing? What was going through your mind? At the end of, she was laying there and she was there for a while. I was, I was amazed at how long they didn't get her in a car and get her out, but they waited and a helicopter came. And by the time the helicopter took off with her and I mean, literally lifted off, we were all glued to that process outside. When she finally left, I, I, I don't know how long it was. She was there, 30 minutes, 40 minutes. It, was, it seemed like a very long time. But they kept saying, well, she's stable. Like, like nobody, just as you disbelieved that there was a live round in the gun, you disbelieved that this was going to be a fatal accident. So you didn't know exactly how serious it was. At the very end of my... You know, uh, yep, I'm just going to read what you said. Uh, I'd like to see all videos at the time Alec Baldwin shot and killed her because he said he stood by her for up to one minute after he shot her. So he was, he having a temper tantrum before he shot her many. I mean, I don't want, you can't, you look, the investigation will find out all of those things. Uh, what in, in fact occurred. But one of the things that I wanted to mention, and I thought you may have been alluding to that was how did he not know he was standing over her? She obviously had to be bleeding. And Joel Souza was shot in the shoulder with the very same round that went through Helena and hit him. How could he have not known also with the explosion of the firearm that the gun did not go off? And in fact, she did not faint. She was a victim of a gunshot. And how he did not know that to me is beyond, it, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't fit the smell test. Uh, uh, what Joe Busto Susan, my theory is it was either accidentally or purposely inserted into the gun. My point is, I would like to see the show's expert, I can recall his name, use the actual model of the Colt used in the incident, 1880, and prove his theory it would not fire using the process Bolden says occurred. Uh, Joe Busto, we had um, John Pellucci on, who was a retired NYPD um, He's a retired NYPD crime scene sergeant. He's a ballistics expert. He went over uh, with a a replica firearm. It was not a forty five, but it was a uh, similar replica gun from that era that operates the very same way that that forty five caliber re- replica. And he showed how Alec Baldwin insisted the gun went off, and he basically said, like what every other ballistic expert I watched on TV said. 
it would be impossible for the firearm to go off that way. He had to have pulled the trigger. Had to have. Unless there was one caveat to that. And that was unless the gun malfunctioned. And what I've been going over ad nauseum is that the first test that all police departments do on a firearm is something called an operability test. Can the gun in fact fire? Is the gun operational? Once they determine that, then that whole defense or that creating of doubt by Alec Baldwin's attorneys will not exist anymore because the gun will be tested and the the ballistics experts will say, no, the firearm was in fact operational. So that'll take away that uh, that little excuse that he may have or may try to uh, use. But uh, let's get back to a little more of this. Interview with the sheriff's department. They said to me, we regret to tell you that she didn't make it. She died. They told me right then and there. And that's when I went in the parking lot and called my wife to talk to my wife. Shock and grief. Helena's husband, Matthew, posted a tribute to Helena. Helena inspired us all with her passion and vision. And her legacy is too meaningful to encapsulate in words. Our loss is enormous. When this happened, her husband comes to town, her husband, Matthew. And I met with him and their son. And he was as kind as you could be. What can you possibly say to him? The, 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 I didn't know what to say. He, he hugged me and he goes, he goes like, I suppose you and I are going to go through this together, he said. And I thought, well, not as much as you are, you know, and his little boy is there who's nine years old. I have, I have six kids now. I have my older daughter, Ireland, but of the six kids that Ilaria and I have, my oldest is eight. I have a nine-month-old baby. And I think to myself, this little boy um, doesn't have a mother anymore. And I know that in my life, I'm with my kids and I'm doing quite well with my kids. My kids and I are having a great time right until my wife walks in the room and then I become invisible. My kids all go and they uh, uh, jump on top of their mother. And this boy doesn't have a mother anymore. And, um, And there's nothing we can do to bring her back. And I told him, I said, I, 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 I don't know what to say. I don't know how to convey to you how sorry I am and how I'm willing to do anything I can to cooperate. In the aftermath of the shooting, a torrent of criticism. The first thing you do when you pick up that gun is you make sure uh, that it's never pointed at anybody. He, he should have known that an AD handing you a gun and saying it's cold isn't the same as several people showing you an empty gun. If I were holding that gun, I would have checked it, wouldn't you? Mm-hmm. People said to me, I mean, I, I got countless people online saying, you, you idiot, you never point a gun at someone. Well, unless you're told it's empty and it's the director of photography who's instructing you on, on the angle for a shot we're going to do. And she and I had this thing in common where we both thought it was empty and it wasn't. And that's not her responsibility. That's not my responsibility. Whose responsibility is remains to be seen. But I well, do, there but are I, some who say you're never supposed to point a gun at anyone on a set, no matter what. Unless the person is the cinematographer who's directing me where to point the gun for her camera angle. Yeah, the uh, the cinematographer is God, and you do whatever she says, even though you're pointing a loaded firearm at her and, and pulling the trigger. That's uh, Is that what he's saying? Uh, unless the cinematographer tells you to do it? I mean, how pathetic is that? I mean, it's it's just, it really is ridiculous that he even says that. You know, guys, this is uh, Coffee with Cannon. If you noticed, I did this show inside today. I just thought because I'd be able to do more things on the computer relative to showing you some of these videos, uh, some of Alec Baldwin uh, talking about what had fact occurred. Uh, if you're not subscribed to Police Off the Cut, Police Off the Cuff, please go to our YouTube, hit the subscribe button, uh, ring that bell, and give us a thumbs up. And uh, we got uh, we got our coffee cups here, Police Off the Cuff, and uh, you can get one of these cups on our 
on our website, with on our merchandise site. Um, so if you uh, again, you can, you can also join us on our Patreon to help support us, or you folks with the green font in the chat. That means you're a member of the YouTube family of Police Off the Cuff, and we appreciate you guys so much. So yeah, I mean, th this this case is going to go on for a long time, and you know something, the husband of Halna Hutchins. He may intellectually think that I have to forgive Alec Baldwin for what occurred, but the reality is you'll never forgive them. You have to, I guess you have to forgive them for your own, your own well-being, your own mental health, but that'll always be the person. How could you ever, ever forgive them? And the reality is also to, with this is that everyone uh, is going to sue Alec Baldwin and not just sue him personally. They're going to sue the film company Rust, the insurers of the film company Rust. So this case is going to take a long time. I think by um, by the spring, they probably will have the decision from the Santa Fe district attorney on whether or not she intends to pursue um, criminal charges against Alec Baldwin. And I would just like to reiterate, because, I mean, we've covered a lot of this show, a lot of uh, this this case, and um, I, I, I'll i put it right out there. I don't like Alec Baldwin as a human being, but that doesn't affect my own humanity and myself thinking of what it must feel like for someone to be in a situation like this. And I 100% think that this was an accident. I don't think there was any malice involved. There was no intent. And I really do believe that he, in fact, had no idea that there was a live round in that gun. But at the end of the day, someone is dead. Someone being Hel Helena Hutchins, a mother, uh, a wife, you know, a daughter, or maybe a sister, a cousin, you know all of those things, and someone has to be held accountable for this. And was there negligence, gross negligence? The law will decide that, a court of law or uh, a criminal court of law or a civil court of law will decide what the level of gross negligence was, and they'll decide on a dollar amount. Because I will tell you right now, there is going to be uh, a huge settlement on this. There will be, uh, there's going to be a huge lawsuit. There is no doubt in my mind that uh, there's going to be, there's going to be civil litigation. And I think everyone knows that. Uh, so it's, it's, it's one of those things that you, you can, you can protest how innocent you are, but it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. You know, as I repeated that thing, uh, Shakespeare says, you doth protesteth too much. And when you protest too much, uh, it sounds like you're, you're guilty because you keep protesting something that you're allegedly, uh, you, you know, you're allegedly innocent from. And it's, it makes you look more guilty. I'm going to show a little file tape also on, um, on the Santa Fe uh, district attorney um, who is, will, will be deciding whether or not to prosecute on this case. And uh, we're going to show a little bit of that and see what she says, because I think Alec Baldwin said something during the week that he was absolved of all criminal liability. Duting, the Santa Fe District Attorney is responding to what Alec Baldwin said in his exclusive interview with our George Stephanopoulos. Kaylee Hartung has the interview you'll only see right here on ABC. This morning, new fallout from George Stephanopoulos' exclusive interview with Alec Baldwin. Honest to God, if I felt that I was responsible, I might have killed myself if I thought I was responsible. And I don't say that lightly. The Santa Fe District Attorney, who could press criminal charges, reacting first on ABC News. You can see that he is devastated by what happened. I think that we could all see that he was not expecting that to happen, didn't want that to happen. For the first time, the actor describing the moment he shot Helena Hutchins. I, I would never point a gun at anyone and pull a trigger at them, never. never. That was the training that I had. You don't point a gun at me and, and pull the trigger. Baldwin saying he was following Hutchins' directions during a rehearsal and never pulled the trigger. 
And I cock the gun. I go, can you see that? Can you see that? Can you see that? And she says, and then I let go of the hammer of the gun and the gun goes off. I let go of the hammer of the gun and the gun goes off. It wasn't in the script for the trigger to be pulled. Well, the trigger wasn't pulled. I didn't pull the trigger. So now, you never pulled the trigger? No, 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 no. The FBI examining that gun and the ballistics to see if they back up Baldwin's story. The DA saying it may be early spring before the investigation is turned over to her. There's no evidence that this was intentional. This was clearly an accident, but perhaps a criminal accident. Just because something is an accident doesn't mean that a criminal act didn't occur. Alec Baldwin told ABC News he doesn't believe he will be criminally charged. Is he correct to make that statement this early in the investigation? I would not say that. Baldwin saying he had no reason to suspect a live round could be in the gun and insisting he is not responsible for Hutchins' death. Your emotions are so clearly so right there on the surface. You felt shock. You felt anger. You felt sadness. Do you feel guilt? No, no. I feel that there is... I I think that is the one statement he made that everyone seized upon when he was asked, do you feel guilt? And I would think his attorney would say, if you're asked a question like that, of course, don't admit to feeling guilt because that that basically gives you culpability and liability. But he came across as not very human when he said, I feel no guilt. I mean, that that's not... Uh, that's what not what you would expect from a human being to say that just shot and killed somebody. And even if it were by accident, I think, I, if God forbid, that happened to me, I would say, yeah, I feel horrible. I feel very guilty, even though it was an accident. But he didn't say that. He more or less, which sort of keeps in line with his um, his narcissistic personality, which I don't think there's anyone that would... Uh, deny that he has that he has a narcissistic personality and um you know you can keep you can talk about this till we're blue in the face but he does have liability in this and he i mean i think most people out in uh social media land tv land they would have preferred that uh Mickey V, uh, you know, someone said, Bill, can the hammer go off? In our demonstration with uh, retired Sergeant John Pellucci, that gun has several safeties. When you pull it, uh, the hammer back, it locks. There's like three levels that it locks. It locks when it first leaves the firearm. And if you let it go, it won't go forward. To the, to the middle, you pull it back a little more, it locks again. So it will not go forward. And then finally, you pull it back and it's totally cocked. They call it half cocked and fully cocked. The only way it can go off is if you pull the trigger, but he's not admitting to pulling the trigger. So it cannot go off the way he said it did. Uh, uh, Fuzzy Doxy, does anyone feel that the DA seemed biased saying she watched the interview? Uh, uh, Fuzzy Doxy, thank you for the 499 Super Chat. The DA is allowed to watch the interview because she's ultimately going to prosecute it. And one of the things she wants to see is as to state of mind. You know, there are four culpable mental states of mind in in the law. One is reckless, one is intentionally, one is criminally negligent, and the other is knowingly. Those are the four mental states of mind. So in this, it'll be decided uh, whether it was criminally negligent or whether it was reckless. That's what the district attorney is looking at. I don't think she she said um, it definitely was not an intentional act. So that would be knowingly would make it intentionally, you know? So, uh, so recklessly, intentionally, criminally negligent or knowingly. So criminal negligence or knowingly, that's what the district attorney is going to look at. And that's, what's going to determine whether or not determined uh, by their investigation, whether anyone, Alec Baldwin, uh, the armorer, Miskatiras Reed, Miskatiras Reed, or um, the assistant uh, director that handed him the firearm. Whether any of those three, uh, it's determined by a district attorney whether their conduct amounted to recklessness or criminal negligence, and that's for a court of law to decide. And if a district attorney 
um, decides to indict for that, they, in fact, will get charged, they'll get arrested, and they'll have to go through a, a trial, either a trial or they'll plead guilty you know, and put it to bed right there, or they'll take it to trial and uh, and fight the charges. So that that's what the case is now. Uh, David Williams, I bet he walks and the gun gets 20 years. Schmitty, thank you for the $5 super chat. I'm thinking roles of who checks the gun need to go. Whoever touches the gun should check it, period, removes assumptions. Yeah, but you know, I used to have a, a boss uh, on, on the police department. I think I told this story the other night, Schmitty. Uh, and he had, it was I forget what the job was, but he asked me how did I know about what I told him was true. I said, Officer so-and-so told me. And he looked at me and he said, would you stake your career on Officer so-and-so? And I looked at him and I said, no, I wouldn't. He goes, then you better check much better than that. The same thing, and even more so, is true with a firearm. Would you stake your own life on whether a firearm is empty? Oh, you wouldn't? Then you better check. You better do a visual and a physical inspection. And you could say 100% this gun is empty. And still, if you hand it to someone else, what should they say? No, the gun's not empty until I do a visual and physical inspection of that firearm. And then I can say, in fact, now it is empty. Other than that, you can't trust someone else. Uh, Joe Busto, Bill, do you think Baldwin saying he has had firearms training will impact the decision to charge him criminally? Yeah, I think that could because he's admitting that he has been trained in the use of firearms. He has been trained in knowing the safety, how to handle a firearm safely. So yes, Joe Busto, good point. Excellent, excellent point. Uh, Cammy Mitch, but it, isn't, it, uh, isn't it an intention to a degree when one pulls a hammer back to fire a gun for a movie scene? No, because he he pulled the hammer back believing in his mind, it would not go forward. But so then, when he's saying that it did go forward, that doesn't make any sense. So he's pl- trying to play both sides of the coin, and I don't think he can really do that. But um, yeah, it, it's it's very complex. Um, it's a complex issue. But he he has had firearms training, and as I said early on in this uh, in this caper, I said he should stop talking. He should stop. Uh, giving interviews because the the court of public opinion is not going to matter if you get indicted for criminally negligent homicide or for manslaughter. The court of public opinion doesn't decide. You know what decides? 12 people sitting in the jury box. So by you putting it out there and making excuses on um, social media and going on TV, no one is is swayed by by what you say. You know, so I, I don't know why his attorney is uh, is allowing him to speak. I think he should say, Alec, keep your, but you know, some, some attorneys can't control their clients. You know, and he could be such an egotist that he doesn't listen to his attorney. Let's play a little more of this. And he's explaining, I, I believe, how the gun may have gone off. Uh, let's uh, check this out. See, that's his whole defense, and that we proved scientifically cannot happen. All right. We proved it. Uh, 
numerous other ballistics experts that appeared on television showed that Alex, his explanation on how the gun went off uh, is in fact impossible. Couldn't happen that way. And I don't want to use the word impossible because every damn firearms expert, every crime scene expert will always leave a little bit of an out. And the out is the only way it could have gone off like that is if it was uh, damaged or inoperable. And early on in the show, I said to everyone that the first test they do in ballistics is, A, they fire the gun into a tank to make sure the gun is operable, that it in fact is is uh, capable of firing a projectile. The second thing they do is an inspection of the gun to see if it's working properly. That includes safety measures, the safety, the cocked back and all the parts uh, working properly. And once they, the ballistics experts, either from the FBI or the Santa Fe Police Department, once they do all those tests, then it's clear that the gun is operable. So any defense attorney cannot say, the gun malfunctioned. Oh, really? And then they'll bring up the FBI agent that did the ballistics test, and he'll testify, well, we did the following tests, and the, the gun passed all those tests. Therefore, we've determined that the gun is, in fact, in good working condition, and it is operable. So that sort of throws out that defense or that um, level of a uh, a level of creating any doubt. Some questions. Uh, the gun was in his hand. He is accountable. He furthermore said he was trained not to point the gun, but he pointed it. The problem is he never listens to anyone. Well, yeah, there, there's a level of... Um, there's a level of arrogance here. Yeah, he is. Um, I think that what most people found out and most people agree on is that he says that um, he has no guilt toward this. Most people found that not to be, uh, you know, not to be what most people would say. If you were in his position, if you fired a gun that shot and killed uh, an innocent woman working as the uh, the camera person, the, the photographer, right? How could you say you have no guilt to that? Folks, this is Coffee with Cannon. She is. I'll try to show you the cup. Police, uh, an arm, an ancillary arm of Police Off the Cuff, the podcast, and you know, I wasn't planning on doing a show today, but you know something, you, you get you get you get hooked on this stuff. And when I saw that letter from the crew that was signed by two dozen crew members of the um, the film Rust, it just um, it sit, didn't sit well with me. And I wanted to visit um, the case again to just see what you guys felt. Uh, I mean. If you feel that this was a self-serving letter that he may have even solicited or the staff or the upper echelon of the film Rust asked people to to sign the letter, if you feel it was a self-serving thing, put a one in the chat. If you feel it was a self-serving thing that somehow they put this like, as if you can vote. Yep, thank you. New member on uh, Police Off the Cuff YouTube. Thank you so much. Uh, yep, I like that name. I don't know specifically what it means if it means yes you just joined police off the cuff youtube thank you so much we really appreciate all our members so uh like were, were they put up to it to sign this as if it's a vote at least the 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 the, the crew voted that he's not guilty i mean nonsense right if you feel that it was it was genuine and they just all got together and said let's write this letter to absolve both the the movie company Rust and Al Baldwin. If you believe that's true, put a two in the chat. I just for my own, this means nothing, but I just for my own personal, uh, I just like to see how you guys feel. Uh, I don't want to sway anyone to vote one way or the other, but um, yeah, it's a little bit. Uh, Danielle, what about the crew that walked off the set? Yes, they existed. And in fact, the guy that I played earlier on, that he claimed there was many things on the set that was. Uh, that were unsafe. And, um, you know, I, th I would think also if, you know, the Hollywood movie business is a very small business. People jump from movie to movie. They have different type of jobs. So 
I would think that if you spoke out, you could be uh, you could be in danger of not working very often in Hollywood. You know, they could say, oh, he's a troublemaker. Don't hire him anymore. You know, he spoke out against this or he spoke out against that. IATSE, we, uh, International Association of Television and Screen Engineers, that's the union. So they have very little to worry about because they have a strong union. And uh, you heard Alec Baldwin allegedly speaking on their behalf. Uh, Junie, not only does, uh, you just flew past me, Junie, not only does everyone check the gun, nobody's shooting at people. He has a greater responsibility knowing he's firing at humans. Yeah, I mean, it, it did in fact happen. Danielle, they absolutely blacklist someone. Yeah, well, that's why I said the Hollywood business, the film business is a very, very small community. And you speak out against that, them. I would think that you may have a problem working again. You know, um, so I, I would think it takes a lot of bravery to speak out against them. You know, folks, I've been on the air now for fifty-five minutes. I just wanted to um, say a few things. Tomorrow night uh, at nine p.m., uh, police off the cuff, real crime stories. We're going to do a little Christmas show, and by that, with, with someone, and actually one of our. One of our fans came up with the idea and sent it to me. I said, that's a great idea. And basically what we're going to do is we're going to have about five or six detectives. Lieutenant Pranzo is going to be on. Uh, Duty Ron is going to be on. Um, Mikey Heinrichs, the highly, highly decorated Mikey Heinrichs. Um, of course, um, my co-host, um, Phil Grimaldi, is going to be on. And they're all going to tell, uh, I'm forgetting someone. Who am I forgetting? Uh, Mikey Heinrichs, uh, Duty Ron, Lieutenant Pranzo. Oh, uh, Michael O'Keefe, uh, the author and the the uh, great cop Michael O'Keefe. This is this is Mikey Heinrichs' rack. When I say polish my rack, that's a sticker that we 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 put out there. Polish my rack. Someone sent him Mikey Heinrichs that with his rack in the background. And that is one of the most, when I say rack, that's the, your medals on the NYPD. Mikey Heinrich had 212 medals. And at the top, that green bar with the clover leaf on it is the combat cross. And he received that twice, which is unbelievable. That blue bar with the uh, clover leaf is the Medal of Valor. He received that twice. In addition, he has 212 department citations, which is next to, you ask anyone, on the police department that knows anything about medals, they'll tell you that is just out and out incredible. And that's Mikey Heinrich. So he, anyway, tomorrow night at nine o'clock, we're going to, we're going to tell Christmas stories from the NYPD. And uh, I don't know what the stories are. We're going to see tomorrow night, but I think it'll be a great seasonal thing to get up there and tell Christmas stories. And uh, we're going to have a ball. We're going to have a ball tomorrow night. Uh, Will I be singing fairy tale of New York? You know, Patty Dunn, I would love to, but you know something? I would get hit with a copyright infringement on YouTube. That's why I can't, you can't, YouTube is very strict. If you sing someone else's song, they'll hit you with a copyright thing. And then you get demonetized. And if it goes to a, a certain level, um, they, they could uh, actually hit you with a copyright strike and three strikes, you could lose your channel. So I'm not going to take the chance. Nicole Bellino. How could um, Alec Baldwin say something so cold and stupid? No guilt. Our vets are returning home broken and suicidal, 22 a day because they're here and there. Brother got killed by their side. I'm, you know, I feel so sorry if you lost your brother. Um, yeah, no, it's 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 very hard to believe. Uh, yeah, it's you can't say I could sing a couple of bars, but I can't sing the whole song or play the song by guitar on, on guitar because you get a, a copyright infringement hit. So tomorrow night, uh, the Christmas show. Tuesday night, I'm taking the night off. Tuesday is my 65th birthday. Yeah, I turned 65. I don't like to admit that, but I guess it's better to turn 65 than the alternative, you know? So that's Tuesday. Yeah, I'm a Sagittarius for anyone who gives, gives a shit. But Tuesday, so I took the night off Tuesday. Wednesday, we have um, John Beza, who is a... Um, thank you, MC. Uh, appreciate it. All you guys wishing me a happy birthday. Thank you so much. In fact, my kids, my two sons are coming up today because we're going to celebrate it today because they both work and they can't celebrate it Tuesday. So 
Uh, we're going to do something tonight, and uh, it should be fun, you know. I guess, as I said, Peter Pranzo, 75 is worse. Lieutenant Pete, you look fantastic. If I could look the way you look when I'm 75, I wouldn't sweat it being 75, you know. So, guys, I, you know, I hope you enjoyed today's show. Uh, I sure as hell enjoy doing this, and I enjoy having all you folks from all over the world join me on whether this is Coffee with Cannon or whether this is um, – Real crime stories. I'm having a ball doing this podcast. I really love doing it. And um, again, I want to thank you guys all for your support. And you know, we're coming up on Christmas and then the new year and everything. I want to wish everyone a healthy and happy holiday season. And again, just appreciate so much your support uh, for Police Off the Cuff and for Coffee with Cannon. You know, even though I never drink the coffee, but Coffee with Cannon. Thank you so much, guys. So uh, I hope to see you tomorrow night at 9 p.m. And uh, until then, till then, I'm like, <laughs> till then, be safe and have a wonderful day. One episode, just ain't enough.